One year we all got excited because there was going to be a rodeo with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans at the Montgomery Coliseum. They'd do one show for whites and another for blacks. My parents bought me a cowboy hat and bought cowboy boots for Delphine. QP kept our horse, Mac, in a pin out back. And every day we'd brush him until he'd shown and we'd take turns getting rides in our new cowboy clothes. And then the word came down that Roy and Dale didn't have time to do two shows after all. So they were cutting hours. That was the South. Claudette excelled as a student in junior high, even though she was younger than her classmates. Her parents bought her a dictionary of her own and give, giving her an advantage in classroom spelling contests. And after school, she usually headed for the library or, if her homework was light, to the King Hill Recreation Center, where she learned to crochet. She studied piano, too, until her mother, impatient for her favorite songs and frustrated with Claudette constantly practicing scales, stopped, playing, stopped paying for lessons. Late in the summer of 1952, just weeks before Claudette was to begin her freshman year at Booker T. Washington High School, her sister, Delphine, came down with a fever Sunday just before church. Her temperature climbed steadily through the afternoon. By nightfall, her body was burning, and the bed sheets were soaked with perspiration. Far worse, she couldn't move her arms and legs to get up. The family tried everything to break her fever, but nothing worked. They rushed her to a doctor the next morning. Claudette. Polio came down on a lot of kids that summer. It shriveled the leg of one girl in our congregation and deformed the arm of a little boy. The doctor knew when, what it was as soon as he saw Delphine. He sent her to St. Jude Hospital and put her in an iron lung to help her breathe. She couldn't move. All she could do was whisper through her breath. That's what my mama said. I used to go to the, in the car with them to visit, but mom and QP made me wait outside the hospital. They didn't want me to get sick too, and they didn't want me to see Delphine like that. Once I tried to slip inside to see my sister, but a nurse caught me and led me back out, screaming. I never, I never saw Delphine again. I never saw Delphine alive again after the day she left our house to go see the doctor. The next time I saw her, she was dead. After that, I began to question everything. I asked God why he didn't answer my prayers. I asked, why would you take my sister? Why did you say no when I asked for my sister's deliverance? My mom disagreed with my thinking. She said, you prayed for Delphine's deliverance. Well, let me tell you what I was praying for. I was praying for God to take her because I didn't want the devil to have the upper hand. I didn't want her to be paralyzed for the rest of her life. I said, mom, I would have taken care of her. I would have gone to school to be a nurse and learned to take care of her. I would have too. Delphine died September 5th, 1952. It was my 13th birthday. Let me go back up and read the section about St. Jude Hospital in Montgomery. To many blacks, the hospital where Delphine was treated was an island of kindness. St. Jude opened in 1951 as the first racially integrated hospital in the Southeast. It provided health, education, and social services to all comers, black or white. Its founder, Father Harold Purcell, was loved by many blacks. St. Jude's was clean and easy to get to, remembers Claudette. Father Purcell refused to put up white and colored signs anywhere in or around the hospital, no matter what anyone said. Okay, that is the end of chapter two, and we'll be moving on to chapter three in the next recording. Thank you.